today on Fixing the Money Thing. Gary continues setting you up for kingdom success. And so God wants you to go. He's got a plan for you. You got to take that first step and you got to go, right? It's important. You know, so many people have plans to get bugs in their windshield and never get out of the garage. Today's kingdom message, how many bugs are on your windshield? I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. Well, today, I want to ask you a question. We're going to start with this question. How many bugs are on your windshield? <laughs> yeah, if you drive at night, you get them really fast, right? But uh, how many bugs are on your windshield? You know, do you have a clean windshield or is it covered in bugs? Well, as you, you may know, you maybe not, uh, we were invited to speak in Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, that's near Nova Scotia. And so we rode motorcycles uh, up there and around 3,500 miles on motorcycles in the last two weeks. And yes, I can still sit down. It's okay. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, pretty intense riding. But we had a great trip up there ministering uh, up there in Impact um, City Church up there in uh, New Brunswick. You know, talking about windshields, um, your windshield's covered with bugs. Uh, you know, those bugs didn't plan to get hit. Did you know that? They're just kind of flying along and all of a sudden smack, right? Well, you know, unfortunately, that's how it happens in life sometimes. A lot of people get smacked around. You know, they weren't really planning on something happening and something just smacks them as they're kind of going about their daily activity. I'm going to talk about that today because you need how to handle this. And I want to start in the scripture, Genesis chapter 11. I've taught this before uh, several times. It's about Abram or Abraham and his daddy's name is Terah. So let's just take a look at this scripture and let's dig into this topic it says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of Abram, and together they set out from Ur the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. And then we have the word but. Whenever the word but shows up in a sentence, you know, there's changes. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, Haran's right smack in the middle of the journey. It's about 1,300 miles, and uh, it's a long way. And so, you know, I can understand, need a break, 700 miles of sand and camel and distance. You need to take a little refresher, right? The problem is they settled there. Now, Terah, Abram's daddy, is never mentioned again in the Bible. But Abraham, who went on to Canaan, of course, is the father of our faith. A lot, a lot of talk about him. So let's talk about this. Genesis chapter 12 then begins in verse number one. The Lord said to Abram, go. You know, so many people have plans to get bugs in their windshield and never get out of the garage, right? You know, Drenda has, uh, I bought her a Porsche uh, for her birthday. And uh, that Porsche is a neat little car. And they're, you know, the car is definitely meant to get bugs in the windshield. It is a driving machine. And if you just look at it, you may look at it and think, it's such a great car. You're missing out on the whole experience of owning a Porsche, right? And that's how it is in life. People like to watch a Super Bowl and clap. But it's much more fun to be involved in the game. And so God wants you to go. He's got a plan for you. But you've got to leave to go. Everyone plans to go, but you've got to leave. You've got to take that first step and you've got to go, right? It's important. And so God said to Abram, go. Leave your country, your people, your household to a land I will show you. So in this case, he had to leave to even see. He had to leave to see. Now, I will make you into a great nation. Of course, here he gets promises. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse. All peoples on the earth be blessed through you. So here's the promise. Go, and here's the, here's the promise. Promises carry pictures. Here's what is in front of you. But you're going to have to go to some place that I'm sending you. You'll not see till you get there. And quite frankly, that's all you need. 
Why would he have to leave his country and his family and the culture? Because they're all settled. They're all settled. They don't want to leave Haran. They don't want to go anywhere. And so it is with you. You know, you've got to be careful that people that you lean to and understand and, and live beside don't influence you to settle. See, God has called you to be the David, the one who takes out Goliath, the one who's different, the one who stands up, the one that is bringing the power of God to bear in the earth realm. And, uh, you know, God's going to say go. And he wants you to go. And uh, you'll have to leave some of the familiar behind because God's always calling you to do something bigger than yourself. And you're going to have to walk with God into that future. But now there's 700 miles between Haran and Can Canaan. And now, you know, when you, when you start out and you hear God's voice, right, it's like so exciting. God's called me to blank, blank, you know, go there, do this, that, start this. And we're all excited about it. And then we launch out and maybe just a bit into it, the details begin to add up. and You begin to realize you're over your head in the natural and uh, things get a little blurry. Is that right? Well, was some, one time so clear it gets blurry. And you have second thoughts. Now, he came to Haran. He understood. He just traveled 700 miles from Ur. And now he's rested. And Haran's not a bad town. Maybe God could use him there, right? He said, no, I want you to go to Canaan. But now he counts the cost. He's already counted the cost. He already knows what it's going to cost him, right? But you're not going to be able to see your future till you step out. You're never going to see the promise till you step out. So you got to hold to the promise. You got a choice. You can either look at the sand or look at the promise. If you look at the sand, it won't take too long for you to talk yourself out of the journey and you're going to settle someplace along the way. But if you hold to the promise, you're going to step into the grace of God and the joy of your salvation and you're going to persevere through obstacles and watch God do amazing things on that journey that you had never seen before. It's going to be a fantastic ending. You know, so many people want to see the end before the beginning. They don't want to jump out till the money's there. They don't want to jump out till they're trained completely and then completely again and then again. They want to draw all the diagrams. They want to make sure they have everything prepared, right? I, in my business, I've got, you know, we've trained salespeople 40 years. They want every bit of knowledge before they ever make their first sales call. I said, no, I'm not training you. You don't need trained right now. You need trained when you have a client. You get a client, I'll work with your client, I'll train you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I give them the basics, right? I'm not going to spend days training them on something they're not ready to use yet. I'm going to train them to get the client and then let me go with you and we're going to train how to work with that client. But it's human nature. We want to know all the facts before we just jump out. But God doesn't work that way for a couple reasons. First off, Satan will pick up on the plan. So God leads with glimpses and dreams. Because you don't need to know about tomorrow, you need to know about today. See, all you need today is what did God say? That's all you need. And the promise, that's all you need. You don't have to know what's out ahead of you, the issues. You just need to know. God said, go, I take a step. You follow me? Yes. It's simple. Now, it's easy to get distracted with the circumstances. But you've just got to make the thought and make the plan. I'm going to go because God said it. He's faithful. I trust him. I'm making that step of faith. You know, everything you see here, what Drenda and I have done, always started with a yes with no provision. The money follows the yes. God's grace follows the yes. Everything follows the yes. Because you don't need it if you're going to say no. <laughs> That's right. It always follows the yes. And so, you know, it's interesting you must develop a plan or a strategy to keep you focused. Because as I said, when you launch out into that great adventure, you know before long, everything gets blurry, doesn't it? Now, you remember how it is when you first heard and you launch out and you get into it and all of a sudden, did I really hear God? You know, you get into the thick of it, you get kind of buried in the, in the, you know, learning new things, it gets kind of fuzzy. You have to write down, I call them memorials, when God speaks, you know, when, it, when he speaks, it's so clear. The anointing is so clear. You must write it down at that moment 
when it is so clear and so crystal clear that you understand exactly what he says, you must write it down because you're not there yet and you'll need to remember what it felt like, sounded like, smelt like when he spoke to you. You have to have a memorial that holds to that date. That's why I tell people when they pray, write it down. Mark eleven twenty four. therefore when I pray, I believe that I receive and I shall have it. So when you pray and you believe they re- you receive, you write it down because there's always a period of time between the amen and there it is. It's in that period of time fear has possible taunting to pull you out of faith. Not when it shows up. And so it is on your journey. You must anticipate that you're going to have to look at sand on that journey to Canaan. Abram, you know what's ahead of you, and you're going to have to remember what God said and remember the promise he's given you, and you must walk it out by faith with that promise in mind. If you start losing sight of the word, you start losing your passion. You begin to question, did I hear God? Or you begin to even question God's character, right? Life begins to fall apart. Your confidence begins to waver in God. You're more open to fear. Fear now begins to talk to you and you listen this time. You begin to play games with the whole mission and begin to take, uh, look for a place to, to stop. Now you're more concentrating on finding a place to rest than it, do you remember how it felt when you first, you just wanted to go, man, right? Just let me get at it. But now in the midst of it, things get blurry. You're tr- looking for a place to lay down. You're beginning to think in terms of survival instead of provision and, and moving forward. You began to kind of Settle. And settling is dangerous. So let's talk about this. Here's a test I want you to think about. Because it is dangerous when things get foggy, don't put up with it. Don't think, well, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Without knowing it, you're sliding the wrong direction. You're parking. You're stopping. You're not dreaming. You're backing up. You may not even realize it. Psalms 44, it's a true story in the Bible, we're going to examine this today, of a group of people. Now, Psalms is written over 500 years by seven or eight or nine, various numbers of people. So, it's not so much who wrote this, but we know from the text where they're at in life. Let's listen to what they say. We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their day, in days long ago. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the people and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did they ar- there by their arm did they bring victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. Take a note of that, for you loved them. And now that's verse 3. Dropping down to verse 9, it says... But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our, en- our, our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy and our adversaries have plundered us. Adversaries, excuse me. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, getting nothing from their sale. You have made us reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their heads at us. I live in disgrace all day long. My face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me. Because of the enemy who is bent on revenge, all this came upon us, though we had not forgotten you. We had not been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path, but you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with deep darkness. Wow. Wow, this is God's people speaking here, right? Yeah? Now Psalms 44, 22, just a few verses down, says, yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Got a problem here, friend. We're not going anywhere. We're parked in the garage. Woe is me, having a pity party, inviting you to come if you want. Pity party starts at three o'clock. Bring plenty of tissues. It's gonna be a be, be sad time. God has abandoned us. You know, have you heard this? 
I don't know why God's not. You can fill the blank in, right? Heard that? I don't know why God's not. Well, there's a reason. This theology out there that says, well, God does bad things, allows bad things, does bad things on purpose is not true. There are reasons that you need to understand. And first off, you're not in faith. Well, you can't judge my faith. I don't have to. You just did. You said it. (laughs) Faith doesn't talk like that. Well, I don't know why God's not. Well, okay. That's not faith. Now, there's some clues here we're going to dig into. Verse 11. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. Clue. When was Israel scattered among the nations? When the Assyrians took them captive. So let's take a look at this guy's commentary about why God abandoned them, right? Since he's blaming God for all of this because... Did you catch it? You love them. You delivered them. You get it? You getting it? He said, you loved them. You abandoned us. We are meant for slaughter, meaning you don't love us. You got it? Okay. So looking over here in 2 Kings chapter 17, Hoshea. Now remember Israel, 10 tribes, northern kingdom, Judah, two tribes, southern kingdom. Hoshea, King Hoshea, is the last king of the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. And it says here in verse 6, In the ninth year of Hoshea's reign, king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. And then it tells them where they were deported to. Verse 7. All of this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshiped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced themselves. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones, Asherah poles on every high hill, under every spreading tree, at every high place. They burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. They worshiped idols. Though the Lord had said, you shall not do this, the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets and seers. Quote, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen. And they were stiff-necked, just as their fathers were, who did not trust the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them to not do as they do, and they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry host. They worshiped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. And he says, we have obeyed your covenant. You have rejected us, yet we've done nothing wrong. We did not miss a beat. We did nothing against your word. Do you think maybe he has a wrong perspective? Now, this is all said, I covered all this with you because of verse 22. Let me read 22 again. He says, yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, in reality, religion teaches this. In reality, this is what religion teaches. It's all about serving, laying your life down, paying the price. God was going to use you and use you and use you with no reward. That's what religion teaches. Right? Yeah. But Paul quotes this. The reason we went through all of this is because Paul quotes this scripture in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8. So let's take a look at that. Verse 35, Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Remember, they said, you love them, you abandon us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardships, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written... 
For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then what is Paul's next word and should be yours? Say it again. Louder. When those thoughts try to enter your mind, the enemy begins to taunt you with those kinds of thoughts about God's character, you should just yell out, no, that is not who we are. That is not who I am. And even if this trouble is real, which sometimes we face trouble, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. For I'm convinced neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any power, neither height nor depth nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul says, no, it's not you. It's not you at all. Jesus has promised to never leave you or forsake you. His love is with you forever. And because of that, the Bible says you can cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Because of that, by his grace, you're being made more than a conqueror. Because of that, we don't partake of fear. We don't meditate on fear. We cast down imaginations that exalt themselves against what God says. We don't focus on the impossibility. We focus on what's possible with God. We don't look at the sand. We look at the promise. And we are persistent in our diligence to pursue what God says. And we have what God says. And we shall see those promises come to pass. So we were invited to preach in Moncton, New Brunswick. We had a choice to go by plane, go by car, or go by motorcycle. So we did motorcycle, 3,500 miles up through Montreal, Quebec City, over to Prince Edward Island, down through Nova Scotia, then down to uh, the East Coast, all the way down, then over to Ohio. Now, through that journey of 3,500 miles, there were a few moments your mind might have said, you know, a plane might have been easier. <laughs> I remember coming out of Montreal, it must be like a major truck corridor for their, uh, you know, travel up there because trucks were just lined up and the road was bad. And so on a motorcycle, you know, you have to be on guard. You have to watch everything, traffic, potholes, you got to navigate the turns, navigate. You got to watch what you're doing, right? But you know what? That's not the time to second guess your choice. Let me say it again. In the midst of your journey is not the time to second guess your choice. Why? Because no matter what I would thought then or what I would have thought about the journey, I am in the journey. And the only way I'm getting back is to ride that motorcycle. So you might want to complain, might want to, you know, bicker. Feel sorry if you're, listen, in the middle of your journey is not the time to second guess the journey. Because guess what? You're in it. You're not there yet. But now's not the time to second guess it. So if you feel settled today, wake up. There's nothing there. Oh, sure, the Porsche looks nice in the garage. You can go out and look at it from time to time. But you know what? That Porsche was never meant to sit there to be looked at. It was designed by engineers to drive. If you want to have a Porsche to look at, buy a model and just build it and stare at that. But don't have a real Porsche in your garage that you don't drive. It's not designed for that. Amen? It's not designed for that. Gary Cassie continues his kingdom teaching next time on Fixing the Money Thing.